very delighted to have our next speaker with us, Iowa State University Consumer Horticulture Extension Specialist, Aaron Stiles. He's a bit of a garden celebrity in Iowa. We all sort of uh, have, have heard him probably on the radio, known to many as a frequent contributor to Iowa Public Radio's Horticulture Friday, Garden Variety Podcast, and the Iowa PBS Gardening with Style. Today, Aaron is talking about community gardening, from selecting and growing produce to managing weeds and volunteers. I think only one of those categories is a plant. The other is not, so different skills. Um, Aaron will cover growing produce for donations, a really important and necessary activity, particularly during the pandemic. He's worked for Iowa State for more than 15 years. In 2021, Aaron became the Consumer Horticulture Extension Specialist, working with county extension offices across the state, answering home garden questions for all Iowans. Previously, he was Assistant Director for Iowa State University's Ryman Gardens and taught horticulture classes. Aaron also worked at the Iowa Arboretum, Callaway Gardens in Pine Mountain, Georgia, and the renowned Longwood Gardens in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. He received a BS in horticulture and biology from ISU and a master's degree in public horticulture from the University of Delaware. Please help me welcome Aaron. It's all yours. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk to everybody here today. Um, I am going to be talking about community garden management, uh, specifically those gardens that we use for uh, donation uh, to food pantries and those kinds of things. But really, much of the information that I'm talking about today does absolutely translate into a lot of different areas. So um, I have the talk kind of roughly divided into three sections. Um, I'm gonna start by talking about working with volunteers, something that we want in a community garden. Um, and I'm gonna uh, then transition to talking about weed management, something we don't want in a community garden. And both of those things um, can be the type of thing that um, when managed really well, uh, makes everything go so smoothly and when managed not very well can be really difficult, right? So um, that's kind of where those two topics came from. And then we'll end with some general kind of uh, uh, discussion about some uh, growing vegetables um, at a community garden or home garden scale. So um, lots to talk about, so we'll get right into it. I'll start with managing volunteers. I, as, as was mentioned, I spent 14 years at Ryman Gardens. I, uh, Botanical Garden uh, in Ames, part of Iowa State University, Conservatory, Butterfly Flight House, 17 acres of outdoor gardens. We used a lot of volunteers. And uh, my roles there uh, gave me the opportunity to work and manage a lot of volunteers. And so this is where uh, a lot of these uh, kind of ideas come from um, that I'm talking about here. So um, I want to start with just some of the, the, hopefully the key things that will help uh, many of you are volunteers. Uh, some of you, I'm guessing, volunteer very frequently. And you feel like you really kind of understand how volunteer management because of your experience as a volunteer. But like with many things, it is beneficial kind of to hopefully hear more comprehensive stuff and maybe remember some things that we might have forgotten. And this very first one here is, I think, one of the things that's so very important when we're working with and managing volunteers, but we sometimes forget about. And that's what are the volunteers' priorities and motivations. You can see on the list there some that are very common, um, but it is really important to understand these things. And the only way that we know this is through an interview of some sort kind of like a job interview. I mean, it's not really a job, right? We don't want to equate it to a job, um, even for like legal reasons. We don't want to equate it to a job. But uh, if we treat volunteers the same way that we would treat employees, having an interview, understanding their motivations, understanding their experience, getting them uh, um, kind of aligned with the best opportunity to, to utilize their time and talents in, um, we have happier volunteers. That's, volunteer more frequently and more often. Um, and that's ultimately our goal. So uh, starting with that interview, understanding their priorities, and that way we can make sure that either the volunteer opportunity is tailored uh, or fits within what their priorities or um, needs are, or that we line them, or we kind of steer them 
to the opportunity that would work best for them. So for some folks, um, you know, if you're uh, want to volunteer and uh, find out like that they don't really like like being out in the hot sun all the time, right? Like that's that's kind of hard. But there might be other opportunities in terms of uh, managing donation sites or coordinating the pickups, um, those kinds of things, right? And so they're coming to you thinking, oh, I really want to help, but I feel like the only thing to do is is help in the garden. And when you find out that there is something different, you have a lot of help from that person in a in a way that utilizes them the best. So. Uh, that interview is so is so very important. Um, being responsive and prompt, of course, is we all appreciate this for the most part. Sometimes we forget. Uh, uh, sometimes, I mean, this may come as a surprise. I feel like sometimes when you're managing a community garden, things kind of go by the seat of your pants, right? Like you just kind of, you're just. <laughs> Some things aren't always planned, and so sometimes it can be hard to communicate some of those things because you just don't know. But even just making sure that you tell them, not sure yet, I will get back to you in a week, or not sure yet, I'll get back to you when I find out, at least allows that person to know that you're not ignoring them or that um, you, they're not important uh, because, of course, they are. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that um, you probably will have to communicate in ways that work well for the volunteer as well as for you. A lot of us like email. It's written down. It's, you can refer to it later. But they're all, there's a huge part of the volunteering kind of cohort out there that really loves text, right? And you may not, uh, but to communicate effectively and efficiently with some of these groups, depending on who they are, that might be the best option. And you don't have to use your own phone. You can set up a, a Google account and text from that if you really want to. There are options out there. But if that's the best way to communicate, then make sure that you investigate that. This is the other thing that I think is so very important about uh, volunteer management that we sometimes forget. It's essentially this idea that you need a job description. And I will argue it needs to be written down somewhere. It can't just be up here. Um, the process of creating that volunteer kind of opportunity description that has things in it like what they're doing, uh, what they need in terms of skills or materials or knowledge, um, or what abilities they need to have, like uh, that they can lift 50 pounds or they can drive a vehicle or you know just all of those kinds of things that are very common in a job description um, are so important here too, as a, even for volunteers. And the process of writing all that down allows you to make sure you think through all of that stuff. And the reason why it's so beneficial is that it makes sure that you fully understand the position so that you can get volunteers matched to it in the best way. So there's no surprises to the volunteer, because nobody likes to volunteer thinking you're going to do one thing and then show up and be like, actually, we're doing something completely different um, and you're not prepared for. Um, and then that means that that volunteer is happy and um, loves what they're doing, and you have more repeat and long-term volunteers, which of course is a great use of your time and a great use of their talents because they can develop and use those uh, to help you um, the longer they're with you. And know that when you really understand the position well, that sometimes it means that the person standing in front of you or the group that wants to volunteer for you um, may not be the best fit for it. And you know that because you've thought it through. A lot of times we think, I just need a warm, I, I'm going to accept all warm bodies, right? Like we're just so desperate for help. But if you have somebody coming in who's not well suited for that volunteer opportunity, does not have a good experience, you, they probably won't come back. You've just spent a lot of time training and communicating with somebody who's not going to stay with you. They don't have as great of a um, kind of like an experience with you, so they're not going to be out in the community just talking all loving, glowing about you because their experience wasn't that, because it wasn't a good match. Um, so don't be afraid to say that. I mean, we do the same thing for jobs too, right? When you hire somebody, you're telling some people no too because they're just not right for the job. And that's okay. Um, keeping good records, of course, is very important. Um, making sure that you're uh, got contact information, all of that, uh, uh, inform all that stuff that you need, 
uh, to keep volunteers safe, uh, to communicate well with them, and to uh, report back on, on what you've accomplished. Sharing those accomplishments is so very important for recruiting and maintaining volunteers because they see the impact they have. And unless you keep good records, you, you can't share that. So that's really pretty important. Uh, training is, of course, very important. We all kind of, yeah, of course, we're going to train folks. Uh, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a whole like PowerPoint thing and like all this, all this stuff. It can just be five minutes before you start if that's what it entails. But it is important to think it through and to do it well. Um, and in the process of training, asking people questions so that you understand their level. Because I think one of the reasons that we always, one of the reasons that we don't always do a great job of training is we don't want to insult somebody, right? Like by going all the way down to the basics and being like, okay, this is how you water. But there are people who don't know how to water, right? You got to figure that out because if you don't do it well, that person that doesn't know how to water well just spends 45 minutes splish splashing around. And if you would have trained them, they would have spent 60 minutes doing it really well. And you would have utilized their time well and your time well. So it's really important to know that. And even if you do find out at, through training, they know how to do this, they get how to water, you still have to show them where the hose is kept, you still have to show them where the water hookup is, you still have to talk about the little jingle thing that you have to do to get the door open to the, to the shed, right? Like that stuff is important. It gets folks bought in and uh, it helps in the long run. So. Uh, don't forget about the, the training stuff and, and asking questions through it can really help make sure that it, it's an effective way to train. This is a really good example of that. This was a very specialized planting at Ryman Gardens. We utilized a huge core of volunteers to put it in. It's one of those gravel gardens where it's like the, the granite rock that's like this thick and you plant the plants in it. Very specialized planting procedure. We had to spend a lot, and if you don't do it well, we have huge weed issues in this garden if you don't do it well. So a lot of time was spent uh, with training on this. Nobody's gonna volunteer for a place they think they're gonna get hurt. Safety is very important. <laughs> Part of it's in training, um, but I can't stress this enough. The safety kind of like goes over everything, and it is, it is important to be um, cognizant of this. It is important that when you see somebody lifting something super inappropriately that you go over and you help them figure out how to do better body mechanics to do that safely, right? They're using a piece of equipment inappropriately. You, you stop it right away and you figure that out so that they are using it safely. Gardening is very physical. There is a lot of potential for hurting yourself. And so safety is of the utmost importance. Having first aid kit around, that kind of stuff, of course, is really beneficial too. Ah, okay. Make it easy and comfortable. So one of the, uh, there's several ways you can do this. Good, clear communication does this. You know, a nice kind of email that says, this is where we're meeting, this is when we're meeting, this is who you're gonna talk to, this is what time you should be there, this is what you should wear, this is what you should bring. Being very clear and direct about those things makes volunteering easier for that person, especially if they're new to it. Um, so that, that's so uh, very important. Setting um, appropriate and realistic dates and times. If you want big groups of volunteers, Tuesday morning's not gonna work well. Saturday morning's gonna work better, right? That's more people are available then. Um, it, it, this is very physical work. Uh, doing a six hour volunteer shift is probably gonna destroy some people, right? Like it's gonna be so much. Uh, so making sure that you have realistic time frames for the work. And, you know, if you're out in the garden in the middle of summer, a 2 p.m. volunteer shift probably isn't great. It's hot. So 8 in the morning might be better, or 6 p.m. might be better when it's cooler. Um, so kind of keeping those things in mind. Providing the right tools, of course, is great. We can't always provide tools, so making sure folks bring the tools that they need. I will argue it would be nice to don't forget the things that are most often forgotten, and those things are gloves and sunscreen. So if you can at least provide gloves and sunscreen for people, um, that can make a huge difference in making folks comfortable and safe, um, which of course is important. And then to uh, uh, the most important part of this, snacks. 
snacks and coffee. It is amazing what a couple granola bars and a pot of coffee can do to make folks feel comfortable, to show appreciation for the work that they're doing. And whether you buy it or you utilize volunteers to bring it to, it makes all the difference. And um, one of the things that's so great about volunteering for many people is social interaction. And that's when a lot of that happens. So it becomes actually one of the most favorite moments of volunteering for most people. So don't forget cookies. Uh, make sure volunteers are busy. There is nothing worse than looking at a group of people who are there to help you out just standing around. And there's nothing that feels worse than, than taking the time to give your talents and time to an organization and then show up and just stand around. So make sure that you have a plan in place, that you have way more stuff to do than can actually be accomplished because sometimes those groups will really surprise you with how much they can get done. And getting done early isn't always great. If, if the group has a lot of motivation in um, volunteering because it's a requirement for a high school class, they need two hours of volunteering and you cut them loose half an hour early, they now have to figure out how to find another half hour to meet that requirement. That doesn't work well for them. So making sure that they stay busy, they keep busy, that you understand their priorities so that um, everybody can be happy, more likely to return, all of those things. Um, check in often, work alongside, um, be able to answer questions, be open to answering questions. Um, and sometimes it's just as simple as making sure you have a name tag on um, so they can identify the person that they need to ask questions to and they can call you by name, um, which is helpful. I kind of alluded to this already. I would argue that for most volunteers, whether they know it or not, the reason they're volunteering is social interaction. It's great to interact with other people while you're volunteering. This is a good example of that. This is a, at Ryman Gardens, uh, they wash and reuse all the plastic containers for the greenhouse and nursery areas. They have not purchased um, any uh, plant containers since like 2006. The only reason this works is because we don't pay people to do it. <laughs> the finances don't work otherwise. It's way cheaper to just buy new containers than to pay people to wash them. So volunteer, the volunteers are what make this a possibility. It is the most, I mean, it's just washing dishes for an hour, basically, right? Like, it's not the most fun job. But when we post, when we would post these opportunities, they would fill within an hour. And the reason why they were so popular is because you just stood around a table and you talked to each other the whole time. And you learned about somebody's travels to Greece and you learned about somebody's grandkids in New York City and you learned about you know, their garden at home and all these other things. And that's what people really loved about that volunteer opportunity. Um, make sure that they, they know what they're doing. Um, and, and what it's for, what the results are. That's why record keeping is so beneficial. That uh, one of the main motivators for a lot of people who are volunteering is giving to a bigger cause. So make sure they know what that bigger cause is. Sometimes volunteers, often volunteers, especially those ones that are reoccurring and long term, become your absolute best advocates. So harness that. Um, and then often they can also become some of your best donors. Um, and many of us are using projects that we would love to have donors for, right? So uh, making sure that they understand that you're sharing successes, that they're excited about your mission, that they know your mission, um, all of those things is really, of course, beneficial. Watch for burnout. Um, <laughs> Ryman Gardens plants about uh, 25,000 tulip bulbs every fall, and they do it in one week with volunteers. It's amazing. Um, but one of the things that you have to be really careful of is folks get really excited about your mission, about your cause, about the work. Um, this, I find this, I, I don't like want to generalize too much, but it's often folks who are fresh out of retirement, right? Like they're used to working 40 hours a week. Now they have zero hours a week, right? So they're like ready to volunteer and they're like ready to do a lot of stuff. And if you're not careful, you will absolutely let them do it. And in, in a year and a half, they are completely overwhelmed by it. But they're too nice to tell you that, so they'll just kind of fade away, right? So making sure that you understand that, that you give people 
ample opportunity to um, not accept something if you know they're doing a lot of work. Um, just trying to do that will help keep them happier um, and also allow them to kind of be around longer. Flexibility is incredibly important. Um, one of the things that the gar at Ryman Gardens we often struggled with were large groups. There are, there are often situations where church groups, corporate, uh, corporate groups, 4-H uh, and Boy Scout groups, they come and some of those, some of those can be big groups of people. We had a state 4-H conference um, where we had like 300 4-Hers in two hours that they wanted to volunteer at the gardens. It was like a whole thing. We said no to it for several years because we couldn't, just couldn't do it. Um, but eventually we figured out how to make it happen. Um, being flexible to allow for that stuff can make a huge difference. Take some planning, um, but making sure that you're okay with that stuff. Um, and this is outdoor work most of the time. So if it's super hot, if it's raining, you have to have a plan B. And that plan B might be another task, or that plan B might just be a good, pro, uh, like a good process for um, efficient and timely cancellation and communication of that. Um, but you need to have it and be flexible. And ideally, you do it with a smile on face, because nobody wants to volunteer for a grump. <laughs> Make sure that you say thank you. Genuinely, and I, honestly, I, I think it's almost impossible to not say thank you enough, especially, I mean, of course, genuinely. <laughs> you can do this in many ways, of course. Offering snacks is a way to say thank you. Um, of course, doing it during, after, maybe you follow it up with a correspondence. If you're really bad at that, like I can be sometimes, you put a calendar thing, like a thing on your calendar to remind you to send it out, um, whatever it takes. Uh, when people feel appreciated, they're much more likely to continue to volunteer for you. They're much more likely to talk well about the things that you're doing. And have fun, of course. One of the wonderful things about uh, being on a college campus is um, we have lots of, of students, lots of young adults. There's nobody more optimistic and um, like just ready for the future than a 19-year-old in college. There's no jaded anything there, right? And sometimes it's just so nice to, to see that and interact with that. And so being at the gardens, we also had quite a few retirees. And that interaction between those two groups of people was one of the greatest things for both of those groups. It allowed for really, I mean, uh, Laverna here loved hearing about uh, um, Rachel's like crazy ex trips on the weekends and stuff like that, right? And she loved hearing her stories about being a sorority mom on campus for so many years and all those, all the stories she had about that. So that kind of stuff is just fun. And that's what, again, brings volunteers back. And that's our goal. Okay, so we want volunteers. We don't want weeds. So I want to kind of really shift gears a little bit here, talk more about um, weeding. And I want to start this with a, kind of like a philosophy check. And that, that is, there is absolutely no garden that's 100% weed free. Your goal is not eradication, it's management. If all you do is change your outlook on what your goal is for weeding, suddenly it becomes much more palatable. We're not trying to, we can't get rid of all the weeds, but we can manage them. And hopefully we can do that really well. And we'll talk about some of the things we can do to do that real, really well. But like just that philosophy, of like change alone um, can make a huge difference in how you approach this and um, hopefully just make it a little bit more enjoyable. I don't know, I, I don't mind weeding. I don't wanna weed like, all the time, but sometimes it's nice to just get out there. You see, it's like, to me, it's kind of like vacuuming or doing the dishes. You see the results right away. It's very satisfying. Um, you have, you know, this bucket full of weed corpses that you can throw in the compost. That's really nice to see, you know, like I got something done today. Um, so I like that. Um, so uh, to uh, adopt this philosophy, that alone can make weeding um, much more uh, easy to do. 
Uh, and, and keep in mind that um, weeding is not as straightforward as we would think it would be because um, a weed is simply an undesired plant, right? So corn in a soybean field is a weed. Um, it just depends on whether it should be there or not. And so uh, sometimes it can be hard to define a weed. Um, sometimes we think something's not a weed and then all of a sudden it is, right? And then that's hard to deal with too. Um, so uh, kind of keep some of that stuff in mind as well. In a vegetable garden situation, there are some things that we can do to help with weeds. Um, first is mulch. Mulch isn't going to get rid of weeds, but it'll prevent weeds. Mulch does a lot of other really wonderful things too. But in the garden, in a vegetable garden setting, shredded bark and chipped, uh, chipped like wood branches and, and things like that don't always work very well because of the way we maintain a vegetable garden, those longer term mulches get in the way. And so using, using stuff that will break down more quickly is certainly more beneficial in a vegetable garden setting. The last one on that list is not necessarily something I love, but vegetable production, commercial vegetable production in particular, almost exclusively uses plastic sheeting as mulch. Um, there's, some, there's some considerations you have to think about. Um, again, it's not my favorite one, but it certainly is an option, so that's why it's there. The other ones all break down relatively quickly. My favorite mulch in my vegetable garden, um, I have planter's paper, which comes on a big roll. It was a little bit of a splurge um, to buy. Uh, it's kind of a thick uh, paper, and it's four foot wide, and so is my raised bed. That was by design. And you roll it out, and you plant through it, and then I would put something like uh, cocoa holes over it. It looks really nice, and honest to God, I have no weeds in my vegetable garden. It's the perfect amount of kind of layering. Um, and then it, by the end of the season, the paper is gone. Um, you can turn those cocoa holes in. Um, which is really nice too. It looks beautiful. Um, so that's my favorite, but everybody has, everybody has something they like too. Anything you can do during the growing season to minimize soil disturbance is gonna help. Of course, many of us till to prepare the garden bed, but tilling during the growing season to get rid of weeds often causes more problems. It turns up weed seeds for germination. It chops up plants, allows them to propagate more easily, sometimes making the issue worse, and it damages the root systems of the things that you're growing. So I used to see this, I remember growing up, I, I, I don't know, like the little mantis tiller, remember that thing? It was like, I think it was the 90s when that thing came out. And folks, uh, you know, they always had, you know, people smiling, of course. I don't know anybody is smiling while they're tilling, but they're in the garden, like tilling up in between all the rows of their vegetables. And, and that stuff, that stuff can cause a lot of weed problems unintentionally. And it also isn't great for the plants. So anytime we can minimize the soil disturbance during the growing season, um, we can uh, uh, help prevent some of the weed issues. Um, reducing or eliminating overhead watering has lots of benefits beyond weed control because anything that's not at the base or the root system of the plant you're growing, the tomato, the squash, whatever it might be, is just watering weeds. So um, setting up soaker hoses, setting up drip systems, or just getting a nice long um, wand so you don't have to bend over and watering at the base of the plants um, is so much more effective, better use of water, and you're not watering in between where the weeds can grow. And the other thing that's nice is that um, overhead watering, there are several vegetables, especially things like tomatoes and all the cucurbits, like the, the squashes and the pumpkins, the melons, the cucumbers. They have a lot of foliar issues, foliar diseases, powdery mildew, black spot, um, or blight, all of these things that are really perpetuated or kind of magnified with having wet foliage all the time. So overhead watering, uh, getting rid of overhead watering can help a lot with those things too, which is a, another bonus. Especially in smaller garden settings, blocks instead of rows can be really helpful. They, blocks are more likely to shade the soil surface. Mother Nature will um, cover any open soil with plants um, if you don't, and usually those plants are ones you don't want. So if we can shade the soil, if we can put down mulch, we can do those kinds of things, we can, um, uh, reduce weeds, hopefully. And I, in smaller garden settings in particular, blocks tend to be more efficient use of the space too. Um, it is better for pollination um, because the plants are in a kind of a, a, 
a block instead of a big long row, so they're more likely to move around um, in that area, which is of course beneficial, especially for some of those crops like the melons that absolutely require a pollinator to make to make uh, the fruit uh, form. So um, consider blocks instead of rows. Um, it can also make rotation easier, and we'll talk about rotation in a little bit. Um, this one's really straightforward. Just don't let stuff go to seed. If all you do is go out and cut the flower off because you don't have time to pull it out or to get like really get into it, you make a huge difference um, in reducing that seed bank that can um, unintentionally form uh, in the garden setting. So uh, just make sure plants, do whatever you can to make sure weeds that you don't want around don't go to seed. And this goes for other areas too. If you have um, uh, perennials that like, um, in a vegetable garden setting, uh, perennials like garlic chives, have you ever had garlic chives? Like you let that go to seed, it's everywhere, right? Everywhere. So uh, just simply deadheading it suddenly makes you like garlic chives a little bit better um, because when you, when you don't, you um, find yourself kind of cursing as you're pulling it out. As I mentioned, Mother Nature will cover bare soil. If you can do it instead, um, then you can hopefully control some of those weeds. Cover crops are a great way to do that. Um, a lot of the resources we find on cover crops are geared towards large operations. Um, so sometimes it's a little hard to figure out how you're gonna make it work for your smaller garden area. The most important thing um, for using cover crops is to make sure that you have an exit strategy. You know how you're gonna get rid of this cover crop because, or kill it at the end. Because if you don't, the cover crop then becomes the weed. So the easiest way for a home gardener to have a fairly foolproof exit strategy is to use win uh, cover crops that winter kill. So I know there's a handout that's available. I listed a whole bunch of them that winter kill, things like crimson clover and um, uh, uh, Sudan grass, sorghum Sudan grass. Um, they'll, they'll die over winter, and so you're much less likely to run into uh, your cover crop becoming a weed. Um, and of course, just like mulch and some of the other things, uh, not overhead watering, cover crops have other benefits too, building good soils, uh, preventing soil erosion, um, uh, lots of other uh, nice things besides just uh, preventing weeds. Um, the vegetable garden, um, if you can start with a clean slate, that of course makes a, makes a big difference. Um, there's a couple of ways that you can, you can do this. Some of us um, like to till our vegetable garden. And if you uh, get out and till your garden about two or four weeks before you plan to plant, um, you can turn the soil over. You'll, you'll get a whole flush of seeds that germinate, and then you go through and you get rid of those little germinated guys. Um, and you can do that in any way. You can lightly hoe, you can use a herbicide, um, a non-selective herbicide. Um, heck, you could even like flame weed. Some organic producers will do this. It's called the stale seed bed technique. So um, you're gonna turn the, turn the soil over, expose all those seeds, get them to germinate, and then wipe them out while they're small, and then not, um, not disturb the soil again so that you're not restarting that cycle over again. Um, can make a huge difference in the spring um, to allow you to start with a clean slate. This is probably, this is the piece of advice about weeding that I sometimes find is hardest to get across and that in that um, the best way to tackle weeds is to just always be working on weeding which is not the most glamorous thing to tell somebody um, and not always something folks really love to hear. There really is no silver bullet. There's, there's no like one thing you can do in April that gets rid of your weeds for the rest of the year. Um, and it is, I find, much easier to spend 10 minutes a day uh, than uh, two hours uh, every other weekend. And you'll also have better weed control when you do it a little by little. I kind of have like a, an unwritten rule in my mind about my garden. I don't go into my garden without pulling something weedy every time. And I try to set things up to make that easy. I have a, a weeding bucket. It's just a bucket with my weeder and, and a pair of gloves in it. It makes it really easy for me to go do that for five or 10 minutes if that's what I need to do. Um, or if I have a moment to do that. Uh, it makes a huge difference in my garden. I can guarantee if you came over to my house and I was showing you my garden, there would absolutely be a moment where I would bend over, pull a weed, and then stash it under a hosta leaf. 
that's fine. Um, you should hopefully doing a little bit all the time um, makes it a little bit easier to swallow, I think. You can absolutely use chemical control if you'd like. Sometimes we really shy away from this in an in a edible garden situation, but when used appropriately, especially to help start with a clean slate as an example, um, they can be very beneficial to preventing issues down the road. Um, make sure you're always following the, the instructions. Make sure, uh, in particular, because of edible, uh, with edible crops, you're looking at the reentry time or the replanting time. Um, one of the reasons why glyphosate or Roundup is so popular to use is because the reentry or replanting time is literally like three days later, where a lot of herbicides, it's weeks later. So um, understanding that is going to be really important if you decide to do this. Uh, there are a lot of folks who really love pre-emergent herbicides. Uh, pre-emergent herbicides disrupt the germination process and the kill the plant that way, so you never see the weed. Um, but you can't use that in certain vegetable garden situations if you're growing things from seed, if you're sowing lettuce directly into the garden, or radish, or carrot, uh, beans, or corn. That's not going to work. So making sure that you carefully consider it is, is, is really important. Um, for most of us in the vegetable garden, pulling by hand is going to be the best way to do this. And um, all of us probably have like a, a weeding tool that we prefer over others. And for all of us, it's slightly different. And these are just some of the examples that are here, right? So my favorite is actually one all the way over on the left there. Um, that's just a dandelion digger, asparagus knife, fish chill weeder, different names, same tool. Um, I love that one, especially in, uh, for perennial weeds, um, not just dandelions, like, gra like little bunch grasses, all that stuff. I love that one. Um, the, the soil knife is another nice one that works very similarly. Sometimes folks will call it hori hori knife. Um, in Japanese, hori means to dig, so it's a dig dig knife. Um, that is a nice tool for some folks. It's also a, a multi-purpose tool. It's great for planting. You can double it as a trowel, um, that kind of thing. Um, which I think is really nice. Um, then we have like a cobra weeder, a Dutch hoe, even just like a pocket knife. Um, a spring-loaded needle nose pliers is great for like those little tree saplings because you can grab onto it and just like pull it out. Um, so that's really nice. You have a scuffle hoe or a hula hoe, so that like cuts stuff back and forth, um, which is kind of nice. All, you know, you can get into like collinear and triangle, like to get in close to. Experiment, find your favorite. One of the nice things about volunteering someplace is that they'll have tools you have maybe not used before and you can try them out. Um, or you can swap with a gardener friend and find your favorite. They make a big difference um, in helping. The other thing I'll mention is that if you can do any hand pulling, um, 24 to 48 hours after a good rain or after you irrigate makes a huge difference in pulling things out. You don't want to work in the garden right after it rains because um, that soil will get compacted um, if you're working in it when it's really wet. But um, typically, especially in the summer months, if you had a really good soaking rain, two days later, one day later, it's usually dry enough to work in the garden without causing problems, but the weeds pull out a lot easier. And if, if it's been dry, then water. That will help too. Um, and then kind of the end, of a little discussion about weeding. If you have volunteers weeding, um, there's a couple of ways. It's interesting because what is a weed? It's something that's unwanted. It's, sometimes it's really hard to, to, to explain to volunteers which plants are the ones that are weeds and which ones aren't. Um, and plant ID isn't always the easiest for folks. And folks get nervous. Um, if they're asked to, volunteers are asked to weed and they're not very familiar with the garden space. So um, there's a couple of approaches you can take with this that can be really helpful if you have somebody helping you with the weeding. One is you can teach volunteers what to keep. Um, this is a tomato. Don't pull out a tomato. Um, this is a really small tomato because it came up from last year. You can pull that one out, right? Like this is a tomato at this stage. This is what we're keeping. Everything else goes. Um, or, if you, especially, this works especially well if you have just a few weeds that are a problem. You can um, teach them to identify one weed and they're responsible for the whole garden space for that one weed. This works really well like midsummer when like purslane is everywhere and spurge and crabgrass. You got like three weeds that you're trying to get rid of. You, you're in charge of crabgrass. This is what that looks like. You pull that. You're in charge of purslane. 
you pull that, um, and that can help as well. And if neither of those they feel comfortable with, that's when they weed pathways, because everything in a pathway gets pulled out, doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> All right, so um, hopefully that gives you some ideas of, of ways that you can manage both the wanted volunteer and unwanted uh, weeds in a community garden or even in just in your home gardens. I want to talk a little bit about growing uh, vegetables, um, specifically for uh, uh, donation to food pantries, but this also can apply, of course, to your home garden. Um, we'll start with what to grow. Um, the list that's there are the, most po the 13 most popular vegetables for food banks to receive. And none of them are probably that surprising, really. Um, I mean, you'll notice things like Brussels sprouts aren't on there. <laughs> This is not a very popular vegetable for a lot of folks. And the really weird stuff usually isn't on there for two reasons. Even if it's really good, um, folks may not like it. But also, um, most of these vegetables, people know how to prepare. Um, one of the things that you can do uh, to help out a, a food bank is share good recipes with them, especially for those things that you know most people aren't eating. Um, I feel like squash recipes in particular. It's like everybody knows a squash, but like, you know, if you give somebody who hasn't a lot of experience with cooking a squash, they don't know what to do with it. So giving them good recipes so that it can actually be utilized, because you're going to have a lot of zucchini to donate, like you always do. Um, there's going to be a lot of butternut squash to give away. So um, that can be really helpful. And any varieties of those could be good, but there's a nice publication from Iowa State that outlines some really dependable varieties of a lot of different vegetables. And there's a program out there called All-American Selections that evaluate uh, lots of different plants and then award uh, uh, their designation to those that perform really well across the country. And they have, have a very robust vegetable um, kind of portion of that program. And so if that vegetable has an AAS designation, it's probably a good vegetable to grow too. It's probably fairly tasty. It's easy to grow, usually disease resistant, which is uh, important for many vegetables um, and, and a pretty, um, high yields. Make sure you site your garden well, full sun, at least six hours of, of sun. And you'll hear people talk, I've even talked about, like, well, if you, it, there are some vegetables you can grow in part shade, like lettuce and some of that. They don't want it. They, they, all vegetables want full sun. So uh, do what you can to get them full sun. It'll make uh, production better. It'll make growing easier. Um, good soils, of course, are important for vegetables. Well-drained, organic soils. Um, that are relatively fertile. Uh, we don't always have this. It was one of the reasons why raised beds for vegetables is so good, because we can very easily create it with raised beds. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. One of the things that um, I am absolutely guilty of is making sure that I site my vegetable garden near a water source. You will need to water your vegetable garden to get good uh, yields at some point during the growing season. And if it's really difficult to get a hose out there, whether it's from a spigot or from like a rain barrel or something, you, you need a water source nearby. Um, it just makes things uh, so much easier. And then specifically with donation gardens, making sure that that garden is convenient, both for volunteers to get to, so it's not hard to find or, or like in a weird kind of part of town that nobody knows anything about. Uh, and then it's also close to the places that you're taking these donations, or at least it's relatively easy. It's part of the circuit, you know, uh, something like that. There are some uh, communities that also collect donations from private gardens to then distribute to pantries. And so that garden, the community garden is a great place to, to serve as that drop off point. So you want to make sure that that's convenient for people too. Um, so uh, keep that in mind when you're citing it. Of course, crop rotation, we talk about this a lot. Crop rotation is really uh, important. And um, this is because vegetables in general have a lot of pest and insect issues. And if we're growing the same vegetables in the same place over and over again, those build up in that location. And so by rotating through, we can minimize that as much as possible. It can help with other things too. Certain vegetables will use certain types of nutrients in more abundance potentially, um, which could possibly be depleted over time if the same thing was growing there year after year after year. Um, but really, it's, a, it's a, a pest and disease management tool more than anything. And 
we talk about crop rotation all the time, and when you have a garden this big, crop rotation is relatively straightforward. But for most of us, our gardens are small. It's hard to move stuff around um, effectively in those small areas. One of the, I think one of the easiest ways to potentially do crop rotation, even with a small vegetable garden, is to establish four beds, raised beds, or just in the ground beds, whatever it might be, four separate beds, and then you're just going between those four, rotating between those four, so that any one group of plants isn't in the same bed, is only in the same bed once every four years. That's, that works fairly well. And there's lots of ways you can divide up um, what is planted together and moves around in that rotation. Um, one of the easiest ones is um, to have one that, uh, one bed is a uh, greens and coal crops, so like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, those, and lettuce and spinach, those things. That's one, one group. Um, the, sol uh, the legumes, peas, beans, that group. Uh, the solanaceous and the cucurbits, so that's the solanaceae family, that's tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplant, and the cucurbits, that's the cucurbitaceae family, that's all the melons and the cucumbers and the squashes and all of those. And then um, the last one would be all the underground, underground stuff. Carrots, beets, sweet potatoes, uh, onions, radishes. That system's not perfect. Potatoes should be with the solanaceous bed, not in the underground bed. None of them are perfect. But your ultimate goal, however you decide to do it, that's one example. There are many others that are potentials. But whatever you decide to do, your goal is to keep family, plant families together and move them together. Because most disease and insect issues impact an entire plant family in some way. Um, and so by moving them around, um, you can prevent that buildup in that location for those potential disease and insect issues. And I put a, um, in the handout, I put a little table that has most of the vegetables that many of us grow uh, divided out by family. And you look at that table and you can kind of decide, um, these are the two I'm going to grow together because I like to grow a lot of certain things and not a lot of the other, that kind of stuff. So hopefully that can help. Um, managing insect pests is a challenge for many folks in a vegetable garden setting uh, because there are so many of them that can be very uh, detrimental <laughs> to yields and uh, plant health. And scouting often is a good way to do this. Um, keeping track, keeping a good journal and, um, or records of things so that you kind of know when to expect certain problems. Because the best way to deal with pests is to disrupt the life cycle, to figure out like when's the best time to hit this thing and prevent it from completing its life cycle. And for some insects, like squash bugs, that's when they're nymphs. But when do you notice squash bugs? When they're full grown like armored little tanks of adults, right? <laughs> So you have to scout earlier for that. You have to know what you're looking for. You have to kind of anticipate it a little bit. And that can make all the difference in, in that issue. Or looking for their eggs, which are actually pretty easy to identify too. But you've got to go out and flip leaves over to see those. And then use your little fingernail to get rid of them. Uh, disease issues, a lot of potential disease issues in vegetable gardens too. Good garden cleanup, not um, in the fall, not overhead watering, you know, using things like soaker hoses um, can make a huge difference with disease issues. Good air circulation, so not over planting an area. I know I just mentioned like planting in blocks and shading out the soil can be helpful for weed management, but you don't want to put stuff so close together that there's no good air circulation. There's a, there's a balance between those two things. Um, all of those can help with that. The other thing to keep in mind is that with diseases, um, anticipation is really important. If you do decide to use fungicides, they work preventatively, not curatively. So you would have to get it on early in that disease life cycle or early when it shows up to prevent it from kind of getting out of control. The other thing to keep in mind is that some diseases are really unsightly, but they're not like a huge deal. And what I mean by that is, um, Almost every year, around the end of September, I start getting all sorts of questions about powdery mildew on pumpkins. Like, they look terrible by that time of the year, and they're just covered in powdery mildew. But frost is two weeks away. Pumpkins are already there. Do good fall cleanup to hopefully kind of reduce some of that inoculum for a future crop. But do I need to spray for that? Probably not. And animals. The ones that we're dealing with the most, probably, for almost all of you, are deer and rabbits. 
And um, all mammals and birds, uh, those kinds of animals that are problems in our gardens, um, exclusion is the best way to deal with them. You will hear, oh, you know, rotten eggs, uh, Irish spring soap, like all the, like, yes, maybe for like three days, that could help. Um, but if you want a good, reliable way to keep animals out of your vegetable garden, it's exclusion with fencing. Unfortunately, that's the most expensive option, typically. But um, it can be very, of course, very effective. With rabbits, chicken wire fencing like this, pinned to the ground so they can't go under it. Um, 18 to 36 inches high is usually enough. I, I always use the, the three foot stuff. I, I sometimes I'll splurge and I'll buy the green coated one and then the fence like disappears. You don't see it, which is kind of nice. I don't know, I don't want my vegetable garden to be super ugly. Um, deer, it's a much bigger fence, but keep in mind that, you know, I think it's an eight foot fence uh, to keep deer out, that's not what most of us can construct in, around our vegetable garden. But also know that if your garden's small enough, deer are not gonna hop over a six foot fence into a tiny little enclosure. So in, if it's small, uh, sometimes a six foot fence is just fine um, for deer. Or at least it, it's enough of a deterrent that they're like, eh, this is too much work, I'm gonna go over here and eat instead. Um, and that's all you really need. Um, especially for produce donation gardens, season extension is a great thing. Um, especially uh, early in the season, uh, for food pantries to get fresh produce is a very welcomed thing. Most of us, most of that produce is going to be going to those food banks in kind of like end of July through the first part of September. But if you can have stuff, fresh produce there, end of April, May, and June makes a huge difference, as well as October and November. You've just added several months on by doing some season extension things. These are low tunnels. This is um, uh, Dan Phileas's backyard. Dan Phileas is an extension specialist uh, based in Polk County, he does uh, commercial vegetable production um, stuff. And this is his season extension. He grows lettuce and um, mostly lettuce um, almost year round under this. So like he's harvesting lettuce in December. I think January is like the only month he's not really harvesting much. Um, this of course is a lot of work. Uh, another option for season uh, uh, extension is to just more utilize, utilize cool season crops more effectively. Um, the coal crops like broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower tolerate light freezes as do things like spinach, lettuce, beets, um, chard, kale, those kinds of things. And so you can plant them before the first frost date they kind of peter out in the middle of summer anyway, so you can plant those cool season crops early to mid-April, harvest through kind of mid-May, which is when you're gonna plant your, your warm season crops, the tomatoes and the peppers and the squashes. Um, they can even stay there a little bit longer until that stuff gets a little bit bigger, and then you can reestablish and grow into the fall those cool season crops again. And you're not like doing this, which is, you know, a lot of infrastructure, but you're still able to provide some really nice uh, produce at all, um, kind of in the shoulder seasons. Don't forget that you don't have to do everything all at once. This applies at the home garden as well as the donation garden. Start small. Once you understand what you're doing and how you can tackle it, then, um, then you can grow that garden, pun intended. So make sure that um, you don't overcommit yourself. It wears out your volunteers, it wears out you, and ultimately, if you overcommit yourself, um, you don't have the quantity or the quality in the produce that you're looking for. It would be much better to have less but higher quality and happiness, <laughs> and happiness with what you're looking at um, in a smaller garden than it would be to kind of really struggle with a big one. And the, the last thing I want to mention is good records of your garden. Keeping a garden journal, whether that's a calendar that you just write on, or your phone, there are apps for it if, you, if, you wanna, if you're so inclined to use stuff like that, or just a notebook. Keeping good records, your favorite varieties so that you grow them again next time. The ones that really stunk so that you don't grow them again. Um, if even that, if, if that's just the basics that you keep a record of, that can be so helpful in the future. And then, you know, for pest management and some of those other things, you can be like, oh, I was cleaning out or I was scouting for squash bugs in early June last year. I got to remember to do that this year. Um, that kind of thing can be really uh, beneficial. 
There are lots of publications out there. These are in your handout too, um, in terms of things that are available from Iowa State in particular to help you with vegetable gardening. Um, so hopefully those can be good resources for you. All of them can be found on this website here. Um, that's our home horticulture website, our home gardening website for Iowa State University Extension. I am always working to try to make that a better resource for everybody. Um, and if there's ever, if there's ever a time where um, you think there's, there's something on there that you would like to see that isn't there, um, uh, let Shannon know, because she can get a hold of me. Um, one of the things that I struggle, gardening is a big topic. There are over 6,000 pages on this site. It gets 3.2 million visitors a year. Uh, it's a huge website. Um, one of the challenges I have is that even with that many, that many web pages, I have not covered all of home gardening, not by a long shot. So um, I'm always interested to know like what folks are interested in seeing information on. Um, I, I've, I've said this uh, to other groups before, but like, I, it kind of reminds me, my, my, my grandmother always complained that the hardest part about making supper was not making supper, it was deciding what to make for supper. Um, and sometimes that's what this feels like. Uh, it's, it's not the hardest part, it's not creating these resources, it's deciding which resource to do next. So if I hear from you, uh, it helps me a lot in prioritizing things. So um, I do have a few minutes for questions few minutes for questions, just a reminder, please come up to the mic so everybody can hear. And also as a reminder, you do have evaluation sheets um, in front of each chair, so please use those, so. Yeah, what questions can I answer? Thank you so much for this today. I can't think of anything you missed all the way through this. This was amazing. My question is, I have a small garden at home about four feet by the length of my house, and I don't have any weeds coming up in it yet, which, during your presentation, I thought, gee, maybe I should be worried about that. I have a few little tiny dill maybe poking up, mm -hmm. and a few little larkspur, and then my marjoram and my thymes. But for the most part, and I keep it mulched every year, mm -hmm. is that a bad thing? I mean, should... No, I, 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 that sounds like an ideal situation to me, actually. Um, and I think a big chunk of that is you probably started out with a, a clean slate for the most part. And um, it sounds like you've been pretty persistent about, you know, you've noticed that you've had dill and larkspur, you're, you're taking care of them. The mulch makes a huge difference in terms of preventing new stuff from germinating. Um, and so it, well, it sounds like Well, and I like was working. thinking this year of putting out a cover crop, hmm. um, putting out a little bit of buckwheat. And would I still have time to do that this spring and have it get up just a little bit and then I can turn it under right away to use in my garden? Would that be a good thing to do this spring? You might be able to get it done this spring. I would probably um, focus on the fall for that one. But um, you might be able to get it done this spring. I think, I think you can uh, I don't know the exact number of weeks that it takes to kind of get to that point. Okay. Um, but we still, I mean, it's still early March, so okay. um, we have some time before we're, I mean, most of us are planting our vegetable gardens mid-May, so, or early mid-May, yeah. so. Um, and my last question was, you had a slide up there um, during the chemical control thing with this cute little house and a greenhouse and raised beds. It's oh, like, yeah. could you bring one of those to my house yeah. <laughs> in about a month? <laughs> <laughs> that is the potting shed at Ryman Gardens. Oh, that, that um, is awesome. And if Absolutely. you've ever seen the, the PBS TV show, the mm -hmm. set that I'm in is inside that potting shed. It's yeah. a terrible TV uh, set, by the way. It's like, it's, it's a very small room. Um, and but we, we love the show. Yeah, we always shoot it in the middle of summer, so it's also a very hot room. But um, yeah, that's the potting shed at Ryman, and it is, it is adorable. Yeah. Yeah. I wish yeah, I had one yeah. too. Thank, thanks again. I really appreciated hearing this today. Yeah. Jackie would like to know which company you use for your paper mulch. Oh, yeah. The, the planter's paper I got from Garden Supply. Gardener Supply, yeah. Um, and like I said, it was a little bit of a splurge for me. Uh, you could probably do the same thing with uh, newspaper, although a lot of us don't have as much newspaper as we used to. Um, and you could probably do the same thing with cardboard, just remove the packing tape. Um, and you could probably do a similar thing with cardboard, but I like the planter's paper. It's easy to use, it's easy to plant through. Um, 
and like I said, it was a little bit of a splurge, but I bought it. I don't have a huge vegetable garden at home, and so it works well. Um, you know, it's lasted me many years because of that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Great presentation. I have some friends that have been talking about using fish emulsion for management. What are your thoughts on that? So fish emulsion, um, some folks will use it for kind of like an, as an organic fertilizer. Um, some folks will use emulsions like that um, as um, almost like as a foliar spray, both to help maybe green things up, but also in theory to help reduce some disease issues. There's not a lot of research that supports that use of it, but um, certainly as a um, as a, f a more organic fertilizer, it can be really nice. The only challenge with using something like fish emulsion is that you never know exactly how much nutrients are in the batch that you have. It varies quite a bit. Um, and the good thing, though, is that most of those uh, more natural organic fertilizers like fish emulsion um, usually have fairly low levels. So you're not very unlikely to burn things or like put too much on. It's just that you don't have as much, um, you don't know as precisely. For some of us, that's fine. For some of us type A's, that's not fine. Um, but uh, I think it's a nice alternative to, especially the petroleum-based fertilizers that we often end up using in um, vegetable gardens. And, and like I said, I know uh, compost teas have been used this way too, like as potential for disease control, like a natural form of disease control. But we don't have a lot of research that shows that that's actually very effective. Um, certainly anecdotally, you'll hear people say, oh yeah, but it's, it hasn't been very well replicated. Okay, well, please thank Aaron again. Really thank great. you.